I know what you're thinking. Our gospel reading for today is about a party, Mm -hmm. a party. And it's about ensuring that there is a good supply of wine. No, 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 not in suitcases, not this time. I know it would be so easy to have a bit of a dig at our Prime Minister after all the headlines about Partygate. But the truth of it is that when I put myself in his shoes and think about what it must be like to feel that all that he'd been part of, all that he'd once hoped for, was now coming to an end, well, I, I sort of know how he feels. The front page headline of the Daily Mail last Wednesday said, Is the party over for PM? And then I think about the church, because things are tough at the moment. One Church of England report puts it like this. In the country as a whole, though not everywhere to the same degree, the Church of England is facing a loss of membership and the attrition of its power and influence. It says the church is not at the heart of the affairs of men and women as once it was despite popular attachment to it as an historical and picturesque institution. Now, that particular report was written in 1964, four years before I was born. But even in my lifetime, I've seen a further loss of membership and an even more marked attrition of the church's power and influence. Is the party over for the church? Certainly, it sometimes feels like the party is nearing its end. And as at Cana in Galilee, the wine is finally running out. The writer Anne Morrissey makes the same connection between our present circumstances and the account in John's Gospel of the wedding at Cana. She says, surely in our parlous state as churches, we must fear that the wine has run out. Surely we too experience the mixture of disappointment, embarrassment and anxiety associated with running out of steam, running out of wine or or just running out. Today, she adds, led by the media, churches are considered to be irrelevant or outmoded, and even a dangerous hangover from medieval times. Our current situation is so different from the past centuries which shaped our church habits. We should not be surprised that our churches creak and even crumble. The wine is running out, she says, and the party seems to be drawing to a close. Now, before we all get utterly depressed, turn out the lights and just go straight home, remember, remember that the fact that the wine had run out in Cana in Galilee was the prelude to a miracle. So what can we learn from that gospel account that will help us now? Well, I think there are three things. And the first is to pray. In the gospel reading, Mary notices what is happening and she brings her concerns to Jesus It says, when the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. The most important thing that we can do is to pray. Praying, your prayers of intercession, your humble petitions change the world. And they also change us and open us up to new possibilities. We need to pray. We need to be inspired. We need God's Holy Spirit to change us, to equip us, to empower us. Jesus was quite clear about this. He said to the disciples, stay in the city. Don't do anything yet. Not until you are clothed with power from on high. Not until God's Spirit has come upon you. We can't do anything of any value to God unless we first come to him and are given the means to do it. Psalm 127 says in metaphors, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labour in vain. Unless the Lord guards the city, the guard keeps watch in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil. You see, we need to pray. We need to come to God. We need to come closer to God. One of the things especially for those who have some kind of role in the church, is that in the anxious busyness of times like these, it's sometimes very hard to fully engage in prayer and worship. Not least because our minds are whirring and we're always looking out for the next thing that needs to be done. And it's pretty hard to pray because we're so busy doing 
the work of God. It is really important for all of us, wardens, ministers, all of us, to make sure that the way that we do the work of God does not destroy the work of God in us. Prayer is literally vital to all that we do. So when the wine is running out, the first thing to do is pray. The second thing is to believe. By that I mean that somehow we have to accept that God can make a difference. In the Old Testament, there's a wonderful story of Elijah and the widow of Zarephath. Elijah makes, meets a widow and she asks, he asks her for a drink. And she's just going to get that when he calls out, oh, and uh, some bread. But the, she then says, I've only got a tiny bit of grain and a little oil in a jug. We've run out of food. They were literally on the brink of starvation. But Elijah says, bake me a cake with the oil and the grain and then make something for you and for your son. But the oil and the grain will not run out. Now, that's all well and good. But at some point, the widow had to choose to believe. She had to entertain the possibility that somehow God could make a difference and that the grain and the oil would not run out. It's a bit like the feeding of the 5,000 and the crucial role played by the disciples. For when they began to distribute the bread and the fish, they too had to choose to believe. They had to entertain the possibility that God could make a difference. Imagine being that disciple looking at the thousands of people and then breaking off a piece of bread and giving it to that first person. How much would you break off? But when you got to the 10th person, the 20th person, the 50th person, and you realise that the amount of bread you have has not gone down, would that change your attitude? As a church, we need to believe that God can make a difference. That in the economy of God, our scarcity can be enough. Actually, that it can be more than enough. All too often, we look at the decline of our membership and at the decay of our finances and we draw a line. We extrapolate. And then we conclude, like Fraser in Dad's Army, that we're all doomed. One American writer says that to some extent we have all become apostles of continuity, extrapolation and derivation. But such a view of the future robs us, he says, of vitality because we believe that what we have is the only source of anything in the future. What the story of Elijah the widow tells us, what the feeding of the 5,000 tells us, what the story of the wedding at Cana tells us, is that what we have is not the only source of anything in the future. For God can take what we have, however small and insignificant it is, and he can do something extraordinary with it. We need to have a change of mindset. We need to believe that God can make a difference. As the wine begins to run out, we need to pray, and we need to believe, and finally we need to act. Even if what we feel called to do defies common sense. And Morrissey makes more of the connections between our present situation and that of the wedding in Cana. She says the allegory for our current plight continues, for it involves actions by others, especially the already weary servants, who are required to draw gallons and gallons of water from the well in order to fill the jars. And she adds, like the weary and drunken servants at the wedding celebration, we have to find a way of trusting the promise of a cascade of grace that will follow when we are prepared to do what Jesus tells us. Do we, she asks, like those at the wedding celebration at Cana, have the energy and willingness to do something quite different? To do something that will demand effort, but not effort in obvious directions. For years in the church, we have been able to do the same thing. We have even had uh, the same service for over 300 years, the same service book. 
Vickers did what Vickers do. People turned up on a Sunday. It was all so simple then. But the times, they are a-changing. And as the party has looked like it's drawing to a close and the wine has run out, so we're being asked to do what we have not done before. Vickers are being told that they need to be more Episcopal in order that other people may discover together their priestly role. All of us are having to change and reimagine the way that we do church. All of us are having to live life differently. All of us are being called by God to do what we have not done before. There are no passengers, no spectators, not in the church. We all have a part to play and we all need to play our part. I remember talking to the late Michael Perham, the Bishop of Gloucester, not long after he'd arrived. Before that, he'd been attached to cathedrals for 12 years, and he said one thing he'd noticed going out to rural parish churches on a Sunday morning was that it really mattered if you didn't sing. In a cathedral, you could opt out, do nothing, leave it all to others, but in the small parishes, you needed to play your part. It really mattered if you didn't sing. And I think that's how it is. You just can't opt out, do nothing and leave it all to others. There are no passengers, no spectators, not in the church. We all have a part to play and we all need to play our part. And how do we know what our part is? The answer is given to us in our gospel reading from John's gospel. Mary says to the servants, do whatever he tells you. That is the key. As the party looks like it's drawing to a close and the wine has run out, we need to listen to God to hear what it is that he's calling us to do. And then we need to do whatever he tells us. When I was just 20 years old, I said to God, I will do whatever you want as long as I know what it is. But I didn't stop saying that prayer just because I was then accepted for training for ordination. I keep praying it. Even now, I will do whatever you want as long as I know what it is. We all need to pray that prayer, to offer ourselves to God, to listen to his call and to do whatever he tells us. When we look at how things are as a church, it's all too easy to feel as if the party is coming to an end and that the wine has finally run out. But we need to remember that when the wine ran out at Cana, it was at that moment, not before, not when the wine was running low, but when the wine had actually run out, that God in Christ chose to act. Who knows what our almighty, generous, loving God has in store for us now? I don't know, but I know this. We need to pray, to get closer to God, to go deeper with God, to be inspired by his spirit. We need to believe. We need to believe that God can make a difference. You know, it is true, it really is true that God is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. And we need to act. We need to offer ourselves to God afresh, to listen to him and to do whatever he tells us. Is the party over for the church? Not at all. I genuinely believe that. Not at all. Not when the Lord is here, not when his spirit is with us. For God really is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work among us. Amen.